Welcome to the 22nd annual Women Helping Women Luncheon. I don't know about all of you, but I am ready for a party. That was some great lead up music. My name is Ann Roth, and I'm so pleased to be one of this year's co-chairs for the event. And though I'd love to be in the ballroom with all of you today, I'm excited we were able to come together virtually to celebrate and lift up Women Helping Women. We offer special thanks to the Embassy Suites for their kindness and generosity in using this year's commitment for next year's event. I'm proud to stand, socially distant, with the ladies and gentlemen here today in the studio, who you'll be hearing from throughout the program. I'm even prouder to work with all, the All-Star Committee, staff from the Des Moines Pastoral Counseling Center, and of the so many women before me that have made this event what it's become today. Today's luncheon marks the 22nd time that women have gathered in support of the Des Moines Pastoral Counseling Center and its important services for women, children, and families in need. If you're new to the center's mission and purpose today, welcome to the party. We look forward to sharing just a small slice of what the center does for Central Iowans with you today. To help guide you through our event today, the talented duo of Laura Palmer and Connie Wilson collaborated to design a beautiful program. We appreciate their generosity and giving their time to add this special element and hope you'll follow along. If you do not see, receive the program by email, you can still access it by clicking on the open program link in the chat room right now, or by opening it on the same webpage that you access today's event. Thanking our sponsors and donors, providing tips and tools for mental health exercises, and other activities fill this beautifully illustrated program. Open it up and follow along or print it for later. Today, we are thrilled to report that because of your generosity and that of many others, this year's event has raised nearly $200,000. From the moment we announced this would be virtual, we knew the event would be different but our special community stepped up all the same and we're simply floored. These proceeds will provide access to mental health services for women, children, and family who are underinsured. Thank you. We're sincerely grateful for each and every one of you. I wanna take a special moment to give thanks to our presenting sponsor, Mary Kay Bruce. Thank you for your continued support of Women Helping Women and the Center and for your generosity in honor of our speaker, Mary Ritchie, our honoree, Mary Ritchie. And thank you to our leadership sponsors, Bank of America, Susan and Bill Knapp, and Wells Fargo. They, along with countless other companies, families, and individuals, have made today's event possible, and we are incredibly grateful. I'm excited to get to the program today. If you've joined our event in the past, you know it's known for speakers and honorees that instill a sense of optimism, hope, and inspiration. For 21 years, we have enjoyed and benefited from the stories and accomplishments of these exceptional women, and today will be no exception. You'll hear from two inspiring women and their incredible stories that demonstrate the importance of mental health counseling in their lives and the ability to share it with others. The global pandemic we are facing today has mo brought more than a deadly virus to our world. It's brought much discomfort, sorrow, sadness and despair to our lives. Being social creatures, our limits have been tested to stay away from the people and activities that fill our cup, from the normalcy that we once took for granted. This time has also brought mental health and wellness to the forefront. I hope we can look back and recognize it as a pivotal time our society faced the reality that so many face each day and continued to work on addressing the stigma and provide easier access to services. This event has recognized that truth for 22 years, raising funds to ease the burden on those that need help. The Des Moines Pastoral Counseling Center was founded in this belief, being one of the only service providers to offer counseling on a sliding scale and to serve those who are uninsured or underinsured. And even now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the center continues to serve the community through telehealth mental health services, deftly adjusting their service almost at a drop of a hat and to keep clients safe, yet still provide critical mental health services. So thank you for donating and joining us today. Whether this is your first luncheon or your 22nd luncheon, we want you to know how grateful we are to your support of the center's mission to bring hope and healing through counseling and education. Before we launch the program, I would like to share two fun announcements that have come to us as a result of our pivot to the virtual format. 
With thanks to a generous donor, all of you participating in this event will be entered into a drawing to win one of 10 $100 gift certificates to local restaurant. A wonderful way to support our local businesses. If you are selected, you will receive your gift card in the mail. Immediately following our program, you are invited to join in an optional add-on breakout session we are calling Reflect and Connect. For those who wish to participate, you will join via the Zoom link in yesterday's email or in the chat box at the end of the program. You will be placed in a small group to reflect on our program and connect with other participants. I will review the simple instructions at the end of the program. Now, I would like to invite Stephanie Askloff, Women Helping Women co-chair, to the podium to share a tribute to our 2020 honoree, Mary Ritchie. Thank you, Ann. I am honored to present to you the person that the Women Helping Women Committee has chosen as our honoree this year, Mary Ritchie. In making this choice, we consider women who are respected in their field, have a positive impact on the community, have an affinity for mental health issues or issues impacting women and girls. And this describes Mary perfectly. We are pleased to add Mary to a long list of esteemed women in the community who have been chosen for this honor in the past 22 years. I wish we could ask all of you to stand and be recognized as we have in our actual luncheons in the past. But please know that even in this virtual setting, we continue to value and respect the accomplishments of all our past Women Helping Women honorees. Mary is a native Iowan. She grew up on a farm in Northeast Iowa and earned her undergraduate and graduate degrees at the University of Iowa. Professionally, Mary worked in Chicago and Washington, D.C. before returning to Iowa to work on a political campaign. She founded Ritchie Associates in 1980 a marketing and PR firm. But like so many women, she heard a different call. And in 1994, she began private practice as a licensed independent social worker, working with individuals and couples. As a practitioner of holistic therapy, she focused on combining the interconnectedness of mind, body, and spirit. And just last year, she retired from her practice. Some of Mary's many and diverse community activities and recognitions almost too numerous to mention. She was the founder of a women's investment club, named a woman of influence by the business record, first chairperson of the Greater Des Moines Leadership Institute inaugural class, small business advocate of the year, past president of Planned Parenthood of the Heartland Operating Board and Foundation, past president of Chrysalis Foundation, founding member and first chairperson of the Iowa chapter of the National Association of Women Business Owners, and a member of the Des Moines Botanical Garden Friends Board. Personally, Mary's farm beginning allowed her to participate as a member of both boys and girls 4-H clubs, and she showed the grand champion Black Angus Heifer at the Buchanan County Fair when she was 12. Mary's an avid gardener. Her yard is a testimony to her green thumb, and the rabbits find her plantings delicious. Mary's an avid photographer. You know this if you've seen her lovely spring photos on Facebook as she uses both long walks and photography to cope with the shutdown. Mary is an avid reader. We've spent many years together in a wonderful book club. The discussions are always lively and we sometimes even talk about the books. Mary is a diehard film aficionado. She is crossing her fingers that the Toronto Film Festival will go on as scheduled this fall so that she can attend for the fifth time. Most recently, Mary has dusted off her old 4-H skills and has sewn and given away dozens and dozens and dozens of masks. One of Mary's oldest friends described, describes her as a true and loyal friend, a super achiever, honest, dedicated, and able to respectfully upset the corporate old boys club, but still leaving everyone feel like winners. And another friend offered this. I choose to believe that there is a reason that you are the honoree in 2020, the year of the coronavirus pandemic. It is because you have long been a frontline responder. Through your entire life, you have answered your calling to help others and to lead them out of dark places to find their light. Thank you. Mary. Thank you. 
Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you to the, the committee and to the center also for this honor. Greetings to those of you out there in virtual land. Um, it's good to be with you. The need for counseling services has never been greater. That's why we're here today. Together, we are showing our support for women and girls in need of important mental health services. Personally, I find what, ha what is happening in today's world bewildering and unsettling. So my garden has kept me centered and hopeful. I'll always be an Iowa farm girl at heart and an optimist by nature, which sustains this love lo lifelong love of gardening. I'm also an amateur photographer, so the garden's changing growth and parade of color offers endless photo opportunities. I love my garden. I walk around it each morning, always discovering something new. Sprouts pushing through the soil, buds and blossoms proving that you can survive the harshest of Iowa's winters. Even the surprise of a spring snowstorm doesn't deter the plants or us gardeners because we know those snowflakes will disappear in the afternoon sun. Mother Nature and I are in relationship with my garden, and that partnership thrives on flexibility. Together, we grow and adapt when weather changes the plans without losing hope, because gardeners and farmers know there's always tomorrow. Gardening's a lot of hard work, though it doesn't really feel like hard work to me most times. It feels more like an extension of my soul, pouring love back into the earth. Given what we're living through now, I believe this is a time when all of us could use more love and more kindness and more grace. The coronavirus pandemic and COVID-19 are more than severe disruptors to our basic routines. They've caused death and anguish and fear. People we all know have experienced significant loss, though that collective grief has been experienced in isolation. COVID-19 has kept us apart these past couple months during very important rituals in our lives. We've missed that physical closeness, the support of loving hugs, even as technology has permitted us to stay in touch. We adapted. And we learned to worship, to sing, to Zoom meet with our friends and family, and have virtual lunches like today's. Even with those fears about getting sick with the virus, some routines for people have remained unchanged. The work performed by essential workers has continued nonstop, from mail carriers to trash collectors to grocery store clerks to police and firefighters. And we will be forever grateful to those frontline responders, the healthcare workers who continue to work in hospitals and clinics, risking their lives every day while saving ours. Our individual and collective coping skills have been challenged to the max, and that added stress elevates anxiety and fears about what the future holds, an unknown future, an unclear tomorrow, and that limits a person's ability to adapt. Too many are teetering on the edge of an emotional mental health crisis. They need a safe place to have their voices heard by compassionate, non-judgmental clinicians like the staff at the Des Moines Pastoral Counseling Center. While I'm honored to stand here today, this event is not about me. Today, it's about the women the girls, the families, and all of the clients at the center, regardless of their ability to pay, who need and receive, provide, need and receive vital mental health services. Together with your help, we'll nurture them and tend to their needs like caring gardeners, sharing our financial support, our hope for tomorrow, and leading with our kindness, grace, and love. Though I wish I was able to see all of you in person, I can picture you in my mind's eye. More importantly, I feel your presence, and I'm grateful, because all of us are in this together.
blessings and peace to each of you. Thanks for listening. Namaste. Thank you, Mary, for all you've done to inspire a positive ripple effect of mental health in our community. We are so honored to highlight you today and commemorate all the impactful work you've done in your lifetime. Let's give another big round of virtual applause to Mary Ritchie. I'm Whitney Warren, and I have the honor of introducing today's keynote speaker. In choosing our annual speaker, the Women Helping Women Committee looks for several qualities. We take pride in always choosing a local woman. We seek candidates who will inspire and challenge us, who will share their vulnerabilities and boldly state their strengths. For the past 21 years, our speakers has, have made us laugh and cry and have called us to be true to our own authentic selves. Let's take a moment to give a virtual standing ovation to all of our past speakers. You are forever in our hearts. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Jackie Servellon joins our long list of women dedicated to inspiring mental health awareness in Des Moines. Jackie stands before us today as a creative business owner, dedicated mother, active community member, loyal friend, and survivor of domestic abuse, coping with PTSD, and reoccurring trauma responses. It is tempting to focus in on the last few traits in the long list of what makes Jackie, Jackie. Domestic abuse, PTSD, trauma. They are hard words to hear. They are, the sources of these words are hard stories to bear witness to. They're even harder stories to have lived through and worked to heal from. But today, Jackie stands before you as the definition of a survivor a fierce advocate for her mental health and the mental health of others, an outspoken beacon of hope for those wrestling with their own traumatic histories, and an actively engaged community member, wholeheartedly investing in her own healing and paying that healing forward for others to learn and benefit from. Mental health is a powerful multiplier. Poor mental health seeps into families, triggering the reality of addiction and abuse we'll hear in Jackie's childhood story. The search and commitment to positive mental health creates hope and the confidence to live our lives differently, better, and in a way that heals more than just ourselves. Jackie is an example of the healing power of deep self-work and counseling. She is an example of persistence, of wholehearted living, and of trauma turned into tenacity. Today, it is our honor to listen to Jackie's story of survival, the steps she's taken to mend her life, and the positive ripple effect she creates by being a brave soul in a broken world. Join me in welcoming Jackie Servellon to the podium. Thank you so much, Whitney Warren. <laughs> um, and thank you all for making this virtual event for the Des Moines Pastoral Counseling Center today. We have all worked very hard over the last several months to adapt to both the good and harder parts of this traumatic time in our lives. Learning to move forward within the boundaries and restrictions we are following, both concrete and assumed. Each of us has this wonderful, magical brain that adapts quickly as a basic function of its purpose. It does this in difficult times to keep us going when things get too hard, which may be an experience many of you have noticed in yourselves. This adaptation of the brain is what I will be talking about today, but specifically in regards to the brain in the face of domestic violence. I'm going to show a couple images, some very grainy, low quality images on the screen here to give you a face to a name. 
as I take you all through a tiny, tiny part of my experience with domestic violence. This is my sister Jennifer, whom I will be talking about in length today. She is radiant in more ways than I can begin to explain. And this is a photo of us as children in Chicago. Jen is on the left, I am center, and my other sister Ginger is on the right. We have a little brother, but he isn't shown. That sink in the background there makes an appearance as well. And this is a picture of us as kids with my mother, just to give you an idea of ages and faces. Now I'm going to share some of my stories, snapshots if you will, some of the memories, both good and bad, that have shaped me and how therapy has helped me create good and be of service out of so much harm. Remember that first picture? My first snapshot is from April 14th of 2018. My sister Jennifer passed away from stage four uterine cancer at the very young age of just 39 years old. And just weeks before, I found myself saying goodbyes to my sister in her last month of life as we faced her mortality. After speaking with the oncologist, her outlook was pretty grim. Chemo to perhaps extend her life, but not save it, or palliative care and let it run its course. Jen, already a survivor of leukemia at 19 years old, and at this point severely malnourished, chose the latter. She also chose a death that would not add to the terrible suffering she had lived with for the last 38 years of her life at the hands of domestic violence, and the shame from the life she chose in life due to the intense trauma and undiagnosed mental health. I am not a mental health professional, but I do have over 30 years of experience as a survivor, along with an intimate knowledge on how domestic violence has brutalized the mental health of the people who I am closest to, my siblings, and myself. I have witnessed firsthand in my years of working with the most at-risk youth in the city of Des Moines the one thing they all have in common, their one common denominator, is domestic violence. The question I'm going to address today is this. How does domestic violence really impact mental health? And sadly, the effect is like a painful wound that if left alone may last a, li may last a lifetime. There is treatment, however, with love and support combined with mental health counseling and services. Services that not, not all domestic violence victims have access to, and services that the Des Moines Pastoral Counseling Center offers to so many in the community. All throughout our life, Jen was much more than a sister to us. See, we grew up in a home savaged by drug addiction and unspeakable violence against children. She took on the role of mother as soon as we came along. So for all purposes, she actually was our mom because our own mother was a very lost, deeply hurt heroin and morphine addict that was completely unable to provide safety or nurturing to the four young children she had given birth to in the slums of Chicago despite her affluent family roots. She would time and time again be unable to provide safety not only from herself but from the men she brought into the home as she sold her young, beautiful body for drug money to numb her own pain. Snapshot. Phone calls with my sister over the last weeks of her life. She often spent this time recalling memories of how she tried but was unable to keep us, her children, safe how she would find our mother passed out on the kitchen floor by that sink you saw with a needle still in her arm, crying, trying to help her get up as a little kid. She would try to take care of us the best she knew how, but she was simply too small to do it on her own. 
Her grief at dying was nothing compared to unresolved trauma from domestic violence. A snapshot. One morning, a few weeks after we found out her, di her diagnosis, I was standing by my window on a phone call with Jen. I listened intently as she told me how a certain song still made her skin crawl and the smell of a barbecue grill made her remember the monster that our father was, feeling it in her body like it was yesterday. She cried and apologized for not knowing how to keep us safe. As a five or six year old child, scratching and clawing at a door, we would one by one disappear behind until someone would pull her away. I knew what they were doing to you all in there, she said. As like many times over the years, I noticed, but unsure why. Her voice would change during these conversations. It would become very childlike until she came back from the memory. This is very sad. I could feel the sadness. I could feel the ache in her words, realizing later in therapy, her diagnosis, along with my own, because you see, we were both victims and survivors of chronic shared abuse and violence. Over the last few weeks of my sister's life, we did not celebrate a life well lived and we did not cherish good memories like most families or many. Rather, we cried together as years of abuse haunted our completely broken relationship. We grieved the years living with a stepfather, a man that routinely beat our mother within inches of her life, recounting the many times we were woke in the middle of the night with my mother's whisper quickly being ushered into unmarked vehicles that took us to safe houses where we would hide out with our mother in an attempt to keep all of us safe. Eventually though, after being moved from one safe house to another, we would always be asked to leave because the staff at these homes simply could not risk the safety of the other families there as our abuser relentlessly engaged an army of men that stalked, intimidated, and threatened staff as he hunted us down. We were his property, and he was willing to take anyone down that got in his way. During our times at these homes, it was the often the only time I really saw how battered my mother really was. You see, she was also a victim herself. During the last days of my sister's life, we grieved a life that was unreasonably hard. We grieved at the pain we saw in each other, keenly aware that it simply should not be ending like this. A life that had been taken away years ago, not by cancer, but by the hands of abusers. Domestic violence changed us in ways outside of our control, ways that we did not yet understand and honestly, too afraid to ask anyone about for fear they might tell us what we had suspected all along. We were too broken to be fixed. During the last days of my sister's life, like many of the days before, domestic violence stood like a wall between us as we silently acknowledged we were doing the best we knew how, which wasn't enough, but we were unsure of where to turn for help. After all, the world, our world, had not been kind to us. During all this, time did not stop, and I worked so hard to cope with the grief in the only way that had not backfired on me in the past, work. So from an outsider's perspective, everything was going great for me professionally. I was speaking publicly on my experiences as a youth offender, I took on leadership positions in community groups, changing the conversation around criminal backgrounds and ACEs, creating trauma-informed training programs for youth offenders, teaching resilient skills which would earn praise from leadership. I was the picture of resilient, a coveted title community members and employers largely celebrate when discussing adversity. I was the ideal employee always taking on more than was expected and delivering on it, positive and energetic, 
bold and innovative until I wasn't. Slowly, things started to unravel for me and I found myself at the mercy of the years of abuse I had packed away for so long as it came spilling out of the rock hard exterior I had spent most of my life perfecting. A few months after my sister passed away, I was in a work meeting, unable to hear the criticism of my work any further. After trying to push the tears down over and over again, I witnessed my body move from my seat and leave the room, sobbing, completely unaware that these criticisms had dug into an already open wound that triggered the same feelings I felt as a young girl while being abused and shamed, as if it were happening in real time. There was no distinction. Later, I learned in therapy, this was a normal symptom of CPTSD, Complex Post Traumatic Stress Disorder, which can often be misinterpreted without proper education on trauma informed practices and an understanding of mental health. Many mornings I would sit in my car before going to work, wiping tears from my eyes, willing myself to walk in those doors, saying to myself, make today better than yesterday, Jackie. Be positive and be happy around everyone. And for goodness sakes, don't cry in front of anyone else. Because I had already been talked to by senior leadership and told that in order to help my coworkers better connect with me, I needed to explain my trauma because they had become uncomfortable as I withdrew more and more from the usual vibrance I brought with me. In the height of all this, I became the center of office gossip and had completely run out of energy to placate the discussion around my mental health because even I wasn't sure what was, com what was happening. I had no idea. After months of trying to keep all the pieces together, I found myself sitting at a conference room table with my employer, a resignation letter in my hand and tears in my eyes explaining, I simply could not do it anymore. Against the direction from senior leadership, my direct supervisor, now friend and mentor, took the most powerful stance of support I could have received at the time. She acknowledged the grief. She recognized how hard I had been trying. And instead of judging me for what I perceived as a major failure, she simply showed me there were options available for me. She took the time to advocate for my needs when I was unable to do it for myself. So that way I could take the time to process through my grief with the help of a therapist and heal the only person in the world I can possibly heal, which is myself. The passing of my sister unearthed deeply buried trauma that I had packed away very effectively with my brain superpower, dissociation. This is a coping mechanism that has allowed me to shut myself off from these experiences that were too traumatic and too painful to stay present in. This has allowed me to forget entire years of my childhood amnesia until something in there came roaring out of me with these conversations with my sister, demanding my attention with flashbacks and PTSD. I couldn't just put it away and move on like I had for most of my life. My body was asking for help. Present day. Now, while I chose not to return to that position, I have spent the last year deep in EMDR therapy, unearthing and understanding the root of my trauma with the support of family and friends. I have chose to dedicate my time to healing myself in ways that allow me to process through it with balloons and working with my hands. As a sensory processor, I have used what most people saw as a balloon business combined with a marketing background, granted, as a creative outlet to work through grief with art. Working with my hands allows me to access different parts of my mind. It allows me to process through a deep pain of trauma created by creating beautiful objects. I have found this to be a pathway for connecting with myself through tactile skills and tuning out the noise of the world because as a survivor, it's often too loud. Creating and working with my hands 
is a way of practicing meditation and mindfulness. This form of care has also facilitated true gentle connection with other women in the community that have listened to my story as I slowly unfold the truth behind a life carved by domestic violence, mental health, art, and healing. These women, one being Whitney Warren, who presented today, a friend, advocate, community builder, she, among others, have showed me what it looks like to support and lift up women. Now, I don't want to send the message that I am somehow magically healed or that therapy is the answer to never feeling the pain from domestic violence. I asked my therapist a couple weeks ago um, when, when it would stop, and she said, you can't undo violence. You can't undo memories of violence. And you certainly can't undo the sadness that comes along with it either. I'm learning that, tool, that therapy isn't a tool to fix the broken because we are not broken. Mental illness is born out of the strength from surviving more than a person should have ever been forced to handle. So as I finish up today, I want to ask that we, all of us, we change our perception of mental health therapy as a solution to a problem. Mental illness is not a problem. Rather, it is a gift from the brain that makes rapid adaptations to keep us safe, much like we've been practicing over the past six weeks. <laughs> as a community, our support comes in the gift of providing mental health access to survivors so that they can finally readapt their brain to a safe present and live a life full of hope and healing. This luncheon, the Des Moines Pastoral Counseling Center's Women Helping Women event raises funds, unrestricted funds. And if you work at a nonprofit, you know how important that funding stream is. These funds are used to facilitate healing with programs such as EMDR, which is Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. It's a psychotherapy treatment designed to alleviate the distress associated with traumatic memories which has been the backbone to my own mental health counseling. They also provide programs called COOL, Children Overcoming Obstacles in Life, which uses an experiential approach to counseling, integrating play, art, food, music, outdoors and movement for children. All of these pieces of my own healing pie that I use as an adult through creating art and expression with balloon installations, writing, baking, and now cooking alongside a community of supportive women. Today, I am certain that we can raise enough funds to provide access for these families and survivors that do not have the financial support or resources so they can live a life that isn't shattered by trauma response from abuse. Together, we can open these doors as a community of women helping women. So the center can continue to fulfill their mission of walking with people through the journey of counseling and education to find hope and healing and to live a fulfilling life. Therapy has given me the insight and courage to follow creative pathways, some of which you'll see pop up in images after this speech. This allows me to stimulate my healing because my needs as a survivor are different than the needs of someone that hasn't had these experiences. And I know that through the center, it can be the driving force for so many others to create beauty in a way that works for them. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, we find ourselves in a studio and there's a small cohort, a whole cohort of us here today to carry out this process and celebration. And it's hard as a human being not to be surrounded by all of you out there on your screens, but I'd like to, I know it's a virtual round of applause, but I'd ask everybody here in the studio to thank Jackie for what she just did. Real applause. My name is Jim Hayes. I'm the executive director of the Des Moines Pastoral Counseling Center, and I want to thank you for being here present with us today. 
I have a number of thank yous to Jackie for her courage and her resilience and her story and sharing that with us and confronting stigma that sometimes happens with mental health. I'd like to thank Mary for saying yes to being an honoree, which was well deserved, and for being such a great partner for us in, in our history and in all the time that you've been working in mental health and being an advocate for us. I'd like to thank our board of directors. I'd like to thank everybody that's involved with the center, but there's some people here from our development team that I really want to thank. Um, so uh, the, the work that the committee has done and the guidance that they have given for that. So for uh, Lori Slaughterdyke, who's our director of development and Terry Spears, who's our director of community relations and Allison Pete and Paige Kennedy, uh, who are all part of that team in addition to the committee. Uh, I, I really want to do another live round of applause for all this work. Uh, that number of the funds that you have raised is a really, really, really big deal for us in being able to help other people. My job for today in just a few minutes is to talk a little bit about the center in general. The Women Helping Women is something that we're known for in the community. We serve men and boys as well. We have lots of services that we carry out. And so I just have a couple minutes to talk about our work in general beyond this event. Uh, we've heard a couple times today about our mission statement that we walk with people through counseling and education to find hope and healing to li uh, live a fulfilling life. Uh, and it feels good in this uh, age of the pandemic to think about hope and healing, uh, both of which we need at this point in time. And doesn't it feel good even to think about hope in a moment like this and to be present with other people, whether in this studio here live or for you and your screens at home, that we are a community supporting one another in this time. So if it's my job to talk about the center, which is a really complex organization, in just a few words, there's nothing better from my perspective as a crafter of words than using poetry, which is so succinct and so profound. This is a poem entitled The Way It Is by William Stafford. There's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing. And you have to explain about the thread. But it's hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you do can stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. My assumption today is that the thread of your life, that which you hang on to, is something that has brought you to this day. In the same way that the thread for Mary Ritchie's life somehow connected her to the center by being a member of our board, by being so involved in the community, and by being an honoree for us today. And to hear the story of Jackie's life and the thread that she has held on to that did not exempt from suffering, but found a way to continue and to persevere and to be resilient as a human being facing such challenges as that. And for each one of us as well, the story of our lives somehow converges in a thread that weaves together this event for us today. And I wanna capture that sense of community by just telling one simple story that I think will describe so many levels of what happens for us as a center. On Thursday mornings, we spend time in consultation with one another, talking about a variety of things, but particularly about cases that are challenging for one another. We have 30 uh, really qualified clinicians that work in our building. We have spiritual directors, we have psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, licensed mental health counselors, marriage and family counselors. It's a really great group, a very talented group, and a very supportive group of one another. And you can imagine the complexity of an organization when you think about all of the services that we provide. I put it onto a PowerPoint, and this is like an epic PowerPoint fail, the thing you should never do. Always have images, not too many words. Well, there's the center. Too many words to begin to describe the wonder of what we do in the community through things like counseling, through things like educational offerings, through things like spiritual integration. In that complex organization, you can imagine that we run into stories once in a while that are so complicated that we need the support of one another. And I'd like to give this one example using one of our counselors, Alicia Kirpan, who came to us through our training program. Alicia is a native Spanish speaking person who's uh, wonderfully bilingual and came to our training program because she heard of us coming from Colombia via Canada to Des Moines to say there's a great place to get some training. 
And she came to this consultation on a Thursday morning with a case that was really complex. The girl's name, we'll call her Maria, was somebody who came to us via partnership that we have with LUNA, an organization here in Des Moines, Latinas Unidas por una Nueva Amanecer, which is a Latinas United for a New Dawn, who confront issues of domestic violence, particularly in the Latina community. We have a partnership with them through a shared grant that happened because of networking that Alicia being in the community and the executive director of Luna, Melissa Cano Zelaya, they got together and found out, wow, we could really help our population by partnering. So Maria came to us via the Luna partnership. And uh, as Alicia began the work with her and shared the case with the rest of her colleagues on that morning, she was telling a story of unspeakable trauma for a little girl. And as I sat there in that room uh, listening to this story, I just felt uh, the weight of uh, this little girl's suffering uh, as a parent and as somebody just having any kind of a human heart listens to this and think, how is this kid ever going to get out of this? How can she possibly survive with all of these deficits and, and horrible experiences that are a part of her life? And the way she's going to do it is by meeting a quality counselor at the Des Moines Pastoral Counseling Center. Our program of children overcoming obstacles of life, which has come up a couple times today, is our, our kids programming. And we work with people from birth all along the, uh, the development, developmental spectrum of life, but particularly for working with children and adolescents. They do wonderful stuff, and, and especially in dealing with trauma, they'll use things like sand and toys and paint which seems like a tremendous amount of fun for the kids as they immerse themselves into these activities. But as they are doing the activities, slowly their story begins to unfold and become free from their bodies where it has been trapped for too long. And Alicia has been kind enough for me to share since that day because she knew how hard it was for me to listen to that story of how Maria is getting better. Just getting better. Encountering hope, seeing that there is a future, healing of memories that are so traumatic that you can't even begin to think about them. Each day getting better through each session getting better. And how does a story like that happen? A story of healing where a kid in despair can find their way to hope. It's through the thread. Never let go of the thread. Hang on to the thread even when you can't see it. And we may not be able to see it at this moment in time, but if we step back just a little bit and think about this story, the thread began to weave, not so much when Maria came to us, but it could have happened, let's say, in 1999, when Susan Ackleson was the keynote speaker for Women Helping Women. Susan just retired from us, sadly, after spending 24 years at the center, and she was the keynote speaker in that year. And it could have been somebody who scratched a check, and guess how much money they raised that year? About $1,000. Somebody who scratched a check at that point in time that then began, became funding for us in our training program, a program that's been part of our history where we have trained incredibly competent and talented therapists through our entire history who are not only working at the center, but all around central Iowa and beyond. Through that training program and the funding and the resources that happen with it, all of a sudden we have a connection where someone who comes to us from Columbia to Canada to Des Moines has heard of the Des Moines Pastoral Counseling Center and of the quality training who said, I would like to be there. And that's how so many of our therapists became a part of our community. Men and women who said, that is a quality organization and a place where I would like to live out my career because they have an incredible purpose and mission. It also happened because of an event like this one. Maybe it was a Women Helping Women luncheon. Maybe it was somebody just uh, in encountering another person where two stories collided. So like Melissa from Luna and Alicia from the Des Moines Pastoral Counseling Center start sharing a story. There's so many service agencies, human service agencies that are present just at this luncheon today. Lots of leaders and employees of other great organizations. Through that connection and that networking, a partnership became possible. It also took the courage of Maria and her family to reach out and to ask for help. And as this therapy was unfolding, all of a sudden we find ourselves in the midst of a pandemic. And we can't see people live anymore because of a positive case that became a part of our community. And so we had to quickly pivot as an organization 
And thankfully, another part of the story is because of fundraising like this luncheon, because of the generosity of Prairie Meadows and Polk County, we had a grant to establish telehealth infrastructure before we even knew this pandemic was coming, and thank goodness we did, because we could pivot Im immediately and continue to help people even in a time of physical distancing. And finally, it is about the thread of just human resiliency in general. That people like you, people like me, are trying to find our way to navigate our way through this crisis and finding the resources within ourselves, whether it's through counseling or in other forms of community, that we can make our way back to hope when we find ourselves in despairing moments. And if you don't believe that it's possible, let me give you just a little example of how this thread weaves through our entire lives. I've just told one story to give an example of it, but I'd also like to do a little exercise for us to give an example of it. What I'd like you to do is to uh, stop, and this is, I know it's hard to just watch the screen, so I'm gonna ask you to be a little bit physical here. I want you to, if you're able, to uh, take your hand and put it over your heart. It's a simple exercise of self-care, of compassion for self, and if there has been a moment in time of late where you have struggled, and who hasn't? A moment in time when you've been afraid? A moment in time when you're wondering why is this happening? A moment in time when you wonder what is my purpose in the midst of all of this? Here is an exercise for you. Put your hand on your heart and simply say, Maria. I'm making a difference. We are making a difference even as we sit at a, as a, at a virtual luncheon today. We are doing good work. We are staying human in the midst of this experience. We are making a difference through this event and in so many other ways in our life. Maria. Maria. Maria, thank you. Thank you for being a part of this event. Thank you for attending. Thank you for everyone who has made this possible and thank you for the resources that are going to help us to continue to create stories like this one where we're making a difference. I hope that we find ways to continue to stay in touch in virtual moments or telehealth or mental health or our classes. I hope that in other times during the year when we reach out to you seeking resources, you might also respond in such kind and generous ways so that we might continue to do our work. And I'd like to give you one last story uh, of how we are making a difference at the center by introducing our next speaker. Alice and Pete came to us not too long ago with an idea to start working with us with mindfulness-based mindfulness stress reduction. She's a certified instructor in this technique to work with anxiety and depression and we refer our clients from therapy to her and she has done incredible work in helping other people. And you have done incredible work because dollars from this luncheon and other ways that we raise money at the center have supported people with scholarships to do work with her. So I turn you over to the able hands of Alice and Pete. Thank you. Hi, I'm Allison Pete. Thank you, Jim, for that generous introduction. Thank you all for joining us for the 22nd annual Women Helping Women event and for inviting me to introduce Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, also known as MBSR. Jackie's story gives us a glimpse into the deep wounds that can be addressed through a holistic approach to healing. I'm pleased to take a few minutes to share with you the science behind the practice of MBSR and also lead a brief guided meditation. I've personally experienced the life-saving impact of both mental health counseling and mindfulness. Our honoree, Mary Ritchie, sparked my healing journey by helping me work through depression and anxiety after my son was born 11 years ago. Through her psychotherapy practice, Mary gave me a life preserver during a very dark time a warm, 
compassionate, non-judgmental presence to help me realize that I wasn't alone and I had every right to feel what I was feeling. I took MBSR a few years later and was so empowered and inspired to share this life-changing practice with others. And following my interest, I found myself in the highest levels of training. I was trained at the UMass Center for Mindfulness where MBSR was created by Dr. John Kabat-Zinn 40 years ago and the Mindfulness Center at Brown University. I've taught since 2016 with nearly 150 graduates. MBSR isn't just about reducing stress. It's about living authentically deliberately, in the moment, so that, to quote Thoreau's Walden, not when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I'd like to share with you that because of your support, lives have been changed. And I have the privilege and honor to witness that in others every time I teach. You are making a difference. MBSR is an evidence-based program to show to that, that we can reduce our stress and anxiety and increase emotion regulation, creativity, and compassion. So I'd like to take a few moments and lead you in a guided meditation, which is the formal cultivation of mindfulness. So if you care to allow yourself to um, feel into your body and notice that this is a pause with intentionality and with purpose. So if you care to maybe take a few deeper, fuller breaths become aware of the invitation to be yourself, not turning it into some big deal. This is not something else that you have to get good at. So the eyes can be open, the eyes can be closed partially or fully. And noticing that we do our best work when we are both relaxed and also alert and at ease. So I'll invite you here to uh, adopt a posture that embodies wakefulness and dignity, whether you're standing or seated, wherever you find yourself, bringing a sense of resolve and reverence, finding the support beneath you, maybe in the feet or at the, at the chair, finding a strong back and a soft front. Meditation is not a matter of self-improvement, but it's a way to get out of our own way to get in touch here with this boundless presencing of our own hearts. Allowing yourself here to drop into the domain of being, this human beingness. Right at this very moment here, there's nothing to do. There's nowhere to go. Nothing to manage, nothing to improve, and nothing to prove either. Noticing here that you have everything you need based off of what you've taken in here during this presentation with these speakers. Checking in with what's on the mind. How is it in the mind right now? What thoughts are around? What are the weather patterns of the mind? More importantly, how is it in the heart right now? And just like Jim did, I'll invite you, if, it, if you care to, to allow yourself to receive your own warm touch in your heart space, somewhere that's comforting for you. Linking up here with the intention for being here right now. What is essential? What do you not want to forget here in this moment? What will you carry with you during this precious time that you've carved out for yourself and for others? If you care to allow the thoughts to kind of just float to the background of your awareness and begin to reawaken your own senses. So perhaps uh, sound in the environment that you find yourself. This can also include silence underneath sound, in between my words. Maintaining here a gentle interest and focus, a curiosity to what is here what are you noticing in the body? Is there 
peacefulness as they're erasing heart. Another interoceptive practice is just simply the body breathing itself. So noticing that you're not having to do the breathing. So just dropping into this moment with whatever is arising here. This moment is special enough if we can be here for it. You'll notice that this is a very simple practice, but it's not easy. The mind has a mind of its own. It will wander and get curious about other places and times. It's not a problem. We can begin again. That moment that we notice we've gone off is a moment of wakefulness. So guiding yourself back to the breath, back to body. Opening the eyes when you're ready. Maintaining this continuity of, of seamless awareness here so that life becomes our meditation. That awareness is our default mode. Thank you for joining me today in this meditation. And now I turn you to our MC, Ann Roth, for closing remarks and instructions for the Reflect and Connect breakout session. Thank you, Allison, and for your wonderful guidance and demonstrating the power of evidence-based methods to address serious issues. I want to take a special moment to thank all of our community members that are battling the virus on the front lines and showing up with courage and leadership. To our first responders, to those working in our hospitals, grocery and convenience stores, health manufacturing and food service, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. I also want to take a moment to commend the moms and dads out there that have taken on several new roles in working from home, teaching their kids, managing their family's emotions and their own, and doing it with few resources on how to approach this new world. We see you and we're very impressed. Keep trucking. If you're not providing essential services during this time or during any crisis, it can be easy to feel helpless. But today, I hope each of you understand that you have provided hope and healing. Through your donation and participation, you're connecting with hundreds of others around Central Iowa to build up the community that celebrates each other and provides counseling for those who need it. I'm incredibly proud to witness the generosity and compassion of this group. If you can turn to your program, there are many people I'd like to acknowledge for making today a success. And, and bear with me as we really go through some of the integral people that, that really make sure that this event could, could be here today and that we could join each other virtual. A huge thank you to the planning committee and underwriting cabinet. The group of women met monthly to plan today's event. When the reality set in that we would not join physically today, they sprung to action to make it happen. They are hardworking and resourceful, creative and enthusiastic. In a nutshell, they were a remarkable group of women. Your leadership has helped to make this year's event one of the best and most memorable, and we're sincerely grateful to each of you. I also want to recognize the Des Moines Pastoral Counseling Center's Board of Directors, whose dedication to the direction and oversight of the center and vision for the future has always been above and beyond. I hope some of you will find an opportunity to interact with the truly talented and highly credentialed staff as we saw in Allison and some of the others today who perform and witness miracles of hope and healing on a daily basis and have worked countless hours to make today happen flawlessly. Visit the center's website should you want to learn more about upcoming educational offerings. Today, we are especially grateful for our caring sponsors, special friends, leaders, and young leaders. We want to extend our deepest appreciation to each of you. We are most grateful for you stepping up to support this cause, especially in light of our virtual gathering. And last, but certainly not least, thanks to each one of you who made time to be here and gave our virtual event a shot. I'm pleased to say we have over 300 people and probably plus on the line throughout Iowa and probably beyond watching and cheering us on. We are nothing if not the hundreds of women and men gathered in support for this vital cause today and every day. If you haven't had a chance to donate or you've been inspired by today's program, I'm confident we can get to that 200,000 number. We welcome your gifts. Please note the Donate Now button that's flashing on your website now. Isn't technology great? Or you can send a check to the center. 
We are incredibly grateful for living in a community that truly steps up and answers the call. I'm blown away with what we're accomplished to date. Your support means so much. There we go. We will now transition into a reflect and connect breakout session. By clicking the link you received in yesterday's email or the link in the chat box right now, you'll be taken to a Zoom interactive video chat session where we will have the opportunity to connect with smaller groups. During this time, you will meet some of the fellow attendees, reflect and connect with one another about this event, and discuss some of our takeaways. I hope you'll have the time to join us. Again, by clicking the link in the chat box, you'll be joining a new interactive session with your fellow attendees, and I hope to see you there. Finally, again, I want to thank you for joining us today for the 22nd Annual Women Helping Women Luncheon. We're so pleased you could join us and appreciate your support. Have a great day. Brother, can you save my soul from the devil?